Thank you, Bill. Um, I'm just going to put in a little plug before I start for the Council of Undergraduate Research because I saw a lot of hands go up, but not all the hands. And um, you have an opportunity. I mean, you can join as an individual member. It's $80 a year. Or you can have your campus join, which is a little bit more, um, and it depends on your enrollment. But if your campus joins, then every faculty member, staff member, anyone can become a member of the Council of Undergraduate Research. So they now have 11,000 members um, because of that, um, uh, and, and I think 700 campuses across the country and some outside the country are members of, of Kerr. So it's, it's a good organization, I think, um, and I think you would enjoy participating more in their meetings except they overlap with ours, so <laughs> you can't go to their uh, annual conference. Anyway, um, I, I really want to thank Manhattan College for hosting this year's Summer Institute. And I, I think it's particularly um, significant that Manhattan is hosting the Institute this year when our theme is supporting student success for undergraduate research. Because Manhattan has, as, as Bill mentioned, they've, they've made some changes in the last three years. But over the last couple of years, they have really expanded their undergraduate research program. And they've tried to pull together the um, various elements on campus to make a unified, um, more organized, I think, program. And this year, I think we heard yesterday uh, that they have something like 60 or 70 scholars on, on campus. And they also put some financial resources into it, $175,000 when they began launching this. And I think what's significant about it is that they have increased the number of students participating in undergraduate research in the social sciences and the humanities as well as um, the sciences. Uh, so congratulations to Manhattan College. And now I'm going to try to remember to use this PowerPoint. Um, So um, last January, um, Manhattan College, one of Manhattan College students, uh, Dylan Gray, a senior physics major, uh, was a panelist at the New American Colleges and Universities National Press Club event, uh, where he talked about his experience, and I was very envious of him, um, with the Large Hadron Collider. And I, Jennifer probably would have been envious of him as, as well. Um, but he spent a month in Switzerland. Um, and it was really, I think, the research that he started in his second year here at Manhattan and continued through his senior year that helped him, enabled him really to become involved, to spend that month in, in Switzerland and have the opportunity to work with international scientists who discovered the Higgs boson particle. And he said when he spoke at the National Press Club, um, it was kind of a nice story that he was working down. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of this. I, I don't know how many miles it is that goes through Switzerland, but 100 miles or so. Um, and when you see it, it's just amazing wires and I don't know, whoever built it, I can't imagine the design of it. But anyway, he was going to cut a wire and, and he asked if he should do that. And the person, the researcher he was working with said, no, if you cut that, you would shut down the whole system. Um, so he's glad that he asked. But he also had an opportunity <clears throat> to do, and I don't understand all of this because I was a theater early childhood major, not a physics major, but um, that he had an opportunity to do something that was really contributing to what they were doing in, in coding some materials. So it was a fantastic experience for him. And I think that's why I believe that every student should have at least one undergraduate research opportunity. Why do I believe that? Because I think research prepares students to observe problems in their environment, to ask questions, to use evidence as they seek solutions to the problems they have identified. And I think these are skills that are going to serve a student well no matter what future career she chooses. And this is part of what we're about at NACNU is through liberal arts education, integrating professional preparation and undergraduate research is one very powerful way um, to do that. And really, I think the only way that you can ensure that every student has the benefits of undergraduate research is to embed research into the, the curriculum. 
And the benefits of undergraduate research um, on student learning and retention have been well documented by people you may know, Susan Russell, Elaine Seymour, Sandy Gregorman, David Lopato, and others. And I suspect that nearly every campus in the United States includes undergraduate research in some form in their undergraduate curriculum. Um, and even countries all over the world are now including undergraduate research in their curriculum. I mentioned to some of you that the, there's now a British Council in Undergraduate Research, and there's a conference in Qatar in November on undergraduate research. Um, most of these programs, however, are what some call the apprentice model, where a few students work closely with a professor, as you're doing here in the summer, um, and sometimes in the academic year, or in an independent study. Few institutions are embedding undergraduate research into the curriculum in the first two years. And while the benefits of the apprentice model um, have are extensively documented, there's really not very much information on the benefits of course-based research. The National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine recently published a report on discovery-based research in the curriculum, and a couple of things that they found. First of all, that discovery-based research provides real benefits in the first two years to um, students and actually through the first year through the, the senior year. And it's especially important for underrepresented students as well. They also found that a lot of faculty don't know about the models that are available of first year or course-based research. And then they also found that if the course-based research is well designed, it will use many of the pedagogies that have already been identified um, by research on, on teaching and learning. So today, I want to encourage you to think about how you can include research in your courses, and especially in the first and second year. Now, I've, done, I've talked with a lot of people about course-based research in first year, and there often are some questions um, that they bring up. We're already busy, and I know you're very busy. Faculty are overwhelmed with the work that they're doing. And so they say, how will we find time to engage first and second year students in research? Some say first year students don't really know enough to conduct research. And the humanities people often say, we don't do collaborative research in the humanities. So I'd like to look for a minute at how we define undergraduate research. Um, and the CUR defines it as an inquiry or investigation by an undergraduate in collaboration with a faculty mentor that makes an intellectual or creative contribution to the discipline. And I like to think of the CUR definition <clears throat> as aspirational, the gold standard that we all want to achieve. Because if you look at that definition, you see original contribution. And that's not something that we're likely to expect from a first year student, a second year student, and sometimes even our third and fourth year students. But if we keep that in mind, I think we're more likely to create the kind of program that has the possibility of preparing students to do that kind of work um, in their future um, career. <clears throat> and I think all students really need to learn to think critically about existing knowledge and to develop the ability to ask researchable questions, explore possible solutions, and use evidence as they analyze the results of their work. And developing these skills can begin in the first year of college. And as I said, the only way to ensure that all students have experiences um, is these experiences is to embed the research into the curriculum, particularly, I think, the general education curriculum. And while I know a lot of people believe that there's not enough resources to engage their first year students in research, Montana State University, with about 15,000 students, has set a goal of ensuring that every student has a research experience. And I probably should say have met the goal because they've been doing this for 20 years or so. And what they've done is they have built an undergraduate research experience into five foundation courses that every student takes. And then each student will choose an, an additional course on inquiry um, research or creative activity in a discipline of their, of their choice. So they really have six experiences 
of undergraduate research as they're going into their major. Montana State has chosen to do the, to integrate research throughout the curriculum as a way to both maximize the student involvement and minimize the cost and faculty time. And I think from my understanding of talking with people at Montana State, it's working very, very well and they have some wonderfully creative um, classes that they developed. So what would research look like in the first year? I'd like to begin by looking at what aspects of the research process might be appropriate for first year students. And I think there are some elements of research that are common to all disciplines, so I'd like to begin there. And a while back, I was listening to Click and, uh, Click and Clack on the, on the um, NPR radio station, um, and the two brothers who hosted the program said, all research starts with one crazy observation. And you might remember that they graduated from MIT, so I'm sure they did undergraduate research when they were students. But anyway, research does begin with observation and a sense of curiosity and asking questions. Good researchers are really good observers. And Louis Pasteur in 1854 said, chance favors only the prepared mind. And in his 1957 book, The Art of Scientific Inve Investigation, Beveridge states that observation is not passively watching, but is an active mental process. Now, all of us make passive observations every day. Um, we may pass a homeless person on the way to work and observe his belongings in the grocery cart. Um, and perhaps see him look through a trash bin for recyclable materials or food. If we just notice, we have made a passive observation. But we might, however, make a connection um, to, uh, between the homeless man on the street and a book review we just read about Matthew Desmond's new book, Evicted, Poverty and Profit in the American City, and begin wondering, what is the eviction rate in our city? And some might take that observation and question to the next level to gather data and perhaps identify causes and solutions. And that would be an active observation. Uh, John Stilgo, one of my favorite authors, really, and I've always thought this book, Landscape, um, what is it, Lands on Landscape History, anyway, would be a great book for a first year seminar. Uh, freshman seminar. But anyway, John Stilgo is a Harvard professor of landscape history, and he's written a number of books about uh, the average person and what can they learn by uh, doing more careful observations of their surroundings. So he opens his class by taking his students for a walk and encouraging them to look around. And his students are able to make some really interesting connections. And one example he talked about in the book is that the students notice the dates on fire hydrants. And it introduced the idea of the shift of iron founding from Worcester to Pittsburgh. And it suggests the question, why did this happen? So he uses going for walks as a way to really stimulate curiosity and possible future projects. Um, in a recent article in the New York Times, which those of you in the East Coast may have, have seen, Amy Herman, an expert in visual perception, and she was a lawyer before that, um, encourages people to increase their observation skills by looking at art um, and asking people to describe what they see. And she uses her method to encourage observation skills in doctors of their patients, and she has in her book some really interesting examples of that, or um, policemen at crime scenes. And she also uses it to develop an understanding that people perceive things differently. And she's found through her work with many different professions that um, the observations that people make uh, vary by profession. So I wonder if you're a psychologist and you looked at this, what observation might you make about the painting? Or if you're an, an historian or a social scientist, uh, sociologist. Um, so what Herman is doing by Developing observation skills is also developing the ability to see things from different perspectives. And I think that's something we probably have in most of our um, learning outcomes, is we want 
students to be able to look at things from different perspectives. Well, in the ultimate observation, over a 25-year period, and involving a thousand scientists from the U.S. and all over the world, last September, um, gravitational waves were discovered, and I think they just discovered another one about three weeks, well, I think they discovered it in December, but announced it a few weeks ago. But this discovery is confirmation of a major prediction of Albert Einstein's um, 1915 general theory of relativity and it opens up a new understanding of the universe. And I think observation in this instance also required true persistence, um, which is a necessary ad attribute for success in, in any field. And I heard some scientists when I went to Caltech um, lecture a couple of weeks ago talk about this, and they talked about you know watching, because it's really sound that they discovered, and listening for these sounds um, over 25 years. <laughs> Um, which was, was pretty amazing. So, in addition to crazy observations, there's another important element that leads to innovation, um, new ideas, and discovery. And a few years ago, I visited um, Christopher Newport University, and uh, um, Andrew Velke, who was the director of undergraduate research, suggested that research is really about the audacity of the question. And that phrase has stuck with me because I think research is about audacious questions. And I think the more audacious, the, the better. Um, the Guardian National Observer in 2013 listed 20 questions that point to gaps oops, yeah, gaps in our uh, scientific knowledge, forgot which slide I was on. Um, and they ask questions like, what is the universe made of? Or what's at the bottom of the ocean? Will we ever cure cancer? And just in case you think those questions are all about science, Lily Simonson wanted to know what was at the bottom of the ocean, uh, what it looked like. So she went to Antarctica with the National Science Foundation to do some painting. And the National Academy of Engineering um, identified 14 grand challenges for the future, issues such as preventing nuclear terror, making solar energy economical, or pri providing access to clean water, something we really need in California right now. Um, and other disciplines have their own big questions. Sociologists and economists are asking, why are some countries so poor? and other countries so wealthy. Or historians and political scientists might be asking what makes a great leader as we consider who should be our next president. Um, humanists and artists ask questions like what does it mean to be human? What does our society value? Or how do we define beauty? And we can ask who will discover answers to these questions and I think it might be the students who are working with you in your undergraduate research program. And some of these questions aren't going to have answers, but I think still exploring the questions um, and the issues that are involved is still a worthwhile endeavor. So this is one of the reasons why I'm a passionate believer in the value of undergraduate research across all disciplines. I'm convinced that involving students, when students are working with real questions and confronting real problems, is the best preparation for any career. Clearly, I think we want our scientists to be creative, innovative thinkers who can wrestle with the big unanswered questions. But I think we also want our teachers, lawyers, social workers, business leaders, and especially our elected officials to also be thinking about the important questions of our society and to be seeking those answers through a process of inquiry, use of evidence, analysis, and discovery. As a personal example, when I began my university teaching career, which was many, many years ago, there were very few women with children in the workforce and even fewer on the faculty. And childcare was considered unhealthy for young children. And just as a little aside, I started my first teaching career. I was seven months pregnant. And when my son was born, the newspaper, um, the Toledo Daily Tribune or whatever it was, wanted to interview me because it was so unusual to have a faculty person 
with a young ch child. So that tells you how long ago that was. Uh, anyway, some educators and legislators wondered if poor children who did not have the advantage of what was then called the hidden curriculum of the middle class could, might benefit from early educational experiences. And a big question was posed. Um, how can we help poor children in the United States have a more equal start with their more advantaged peers? And Head Start was born. From that question in the Head Start program came much research and many more social programs. And we now know a whole lot more about early learning, questions about nurture versus nature, and the effect of early child care. Some of this research was basic psychological and developmental research. Um, other research was applied, and some was public policy research. But all of this was important to answering the big question and understanding all of the issues surrounding early child care and learning. In a study of change makers, the one thing that they had in common was their exceptional ability to ask questions. And Warren Berger, author of A More Beautiful Question, defines a beautiful question as an ambitious yet actionable question that can begin to shift the way we perceive or think about something and that might act as a catalyst to bring about change. And Head Start is a good example, I think, of a beautiful question. It would be helpful um, for research, innovation, and discovery. If we could look at the mind through a, what a child's eyes, or what some have called a beginner's mind, um, seeing things without labels and without categorization, the beginner's mind is more open to possibilities. And one technique suggested by Stanford professor um, Bob Sutton is something he calls vuja day. Uh, the ability to look at what's always been there but goes unnoticed, and to look at it with fresh eyes. So several years ago, I was invited to Mercer University. And on the way to Macon, I noticed several billboards along the highway advertising Asian spas. And I wondered what made an Asian spa different from any other spa. And the Mercer students looked at those billboards with fresh eyes, and they asked the same question. And the Mercer students decided to investigate. And they found that the Asian spas were not spas at all, but were brothels. And that the Asian women had been sex trafficked. But the students didn't stop, however, when they answered their first question. They wanted to know why there was sex trafficking in their community. And where did the women come from? And what could be done about it? And so they found out that Atlanta and Macon were hubs for sex trafficking because the laws in Georgia were very lax. And I think also the fact that Atlanta is a major airport hub uh, contributed to that. Um, so what the students did was they drafted new legislation. They held a national conference that 100, 900 people from all over the country attended. And they provided education for the local police, because the local police had been arresting the women rather than the, the men that attended the, or went to these brothels. And what they did is they made really significant changes in their community because they made an observation, they asked a question, and they sought answers. So as you know, my field is, um, as Bill mentioned, is early childhood education. And I think we all know that children are great observers of their surroundings, and they constantly ask questions. Undergraduate research is about further developing and maintaining these two very important skills. We also know that young children are very persistent. Um, we've observed the toddler learning to walk, how he falls down and he'll get up and try again or the, pre the preschool child who's trying to put a puzzle together and keeps at it until she gets the pieces in place. Um, as we think about undergraduate research, I think we need to keep in mind these basic skills of observation, curiosity, asking questions, and persistence.
and nurture their continued development. Because we want to help our students develop um, what Pasteur called the prepared mind so that they can turn some of those observations into audacious questions and research for knowledge. And we want them to be able to make connections and observations. And I think developing the ability to become really active observers and skill in framing researchable questions are skills that cut across all disciplines and can be developed in the first two years of college. So I'd like to look at some examples of course-based research in the first two years. I've done a lot of work with community colleges and developing undergraduate research programs. And they've been engaged in this for several years. And of course, community colleges only have the first and second year. So if they're going to do undergraduate research, it has to be appropriate for the first and second year. Gita Bengera is a dean of undergraduate research at Bellevue Community College in Washington State. And she has integrated research into a genomics course um, that she teaches. And the course is primarily a research laboratory course with the students learning how to do s the sequencing and analysis of a bacterial strain of wheat. And after the initial collaboration um, or collaborative sequencing, which the students and the professor do all together, um, the students do four more clones on their own. Uh, and what the students are doing, they do a literature review prior to their lab work, and then they participate in a once a week journal club where they write a summary of related articles, and at the end of the course, they develop and present a poster. And what Jita has done is she's identified what our graduate students like to, likely to do in their research and she's adapted it to first year students with the goal of preparing students so that they can go on to a four year college. This is funded by the National Science Foundation and there's 18 campuses um, in Washington including some four year colleges who have adopted similar approaches um, through the NSF grant. In another case, students in Andy Baldwin's biology class at Mesa Community College are studying rattlesnakes. They have a lot of rattlesnakes on their campus and they would appear at the door, you know, outside the classroom door. And they used to just get rid of them. But they, they decided, wait, wait a minute, we have this resource, we could use it um, for research. Um, so what they are now doing is they're collecting the rattlesnakes and they tag them. And by doing this, they can identify the range of rattlesnake movement, what they eat, when they mate, and where they choose to live. So I, I wonder if you think about it, you know, what kind of things on your campus or in your community might be used to, um, as resources for undergraduate research. I, I don't think any of you have rattlesnakes maybe, but um, you might have other things that are a little more comfortable to deal with. <laughs> so I'd like to look at now at some examples from four-year colleges. And um, this one is from the Department of Biological Sciences at St. Edwards University. And I think Gary Morris, are you, where are you? There he is. So if you have more questions about this, because it's a wonderful project, you can ask Gary. Anyway, um, what they have done is incorporated undergraduate, the undergraduate research experience into their first year laboratory course. And the impetus for their approach, for their approach was the desire to provide all science students with a research experience that the campus sees as a social justice issue because typically it's students who can afford to do summer research who get to do it. And so by doing it in their first year biology course, all students have it. And they have approximately 300 students in 12 sections of this course. And what they do is they investigate the issue of water quality and urbanization. And so the campus is providing student data to the city of Austin. And the students develop an annotated bibliography they develop a research question, and they gather and analyze data. And then they communicate their results. So what they're having the experience of doing real research, of discovering new information, and contributing it to cumulative knowledge on the research question. Um, this is Bob Full. He's one of my favorite professors. He's a professor of biology as well at the University of California. And Bob has said that he loves to have 
first-year students into his lab, even those who are not majoring in biology, because they come to the lab with untainted ideas, and they're not fearful of asking audacious questions that professionals in the field might not think about asking. And Bob told me that when he was, he does it, he's been doing this for years, but his colleagues would say, why are you spending so much time with undergraduates? Because you're going to lose your research agenda and not get any grants. And he said that he, he bet them that he would end up with more grant funding than they would because of getting these ideas from students. And he, so far, I think he's always been right. Um, so many of the discoveries that are in his lab have come from these audacious questions that these first-year students who don't know any better are, are asking. And one interesting example, and some of you who are the scientists in here might have probably heard of this, but was a student, Tanya Shea, who is now a professor at Temple University. And she asked how geckos so, could so easily climb walls. And the students at first thought they must have something sticky on their, uh, their feet that allowed them to do that. But when they really investigated it, um, what they found is that they had thousands of minute hairs that could be manipulated so that they could climb up, up walls. And so this initial question that the students asked and the subsequent discovery that they made has led to a host of products that um, have been have been or, or will be useful to society. And I, some of you may have seen the article recently, I think, in the New York Times, that Bob Full's most recent research is on um, cockroaches, something that's readily available in many areas. Um, but if, I, I wish I had a video, but he has a lot of um, TED Talks, and you can see this. So he has cockroaches on a treadmill. Um, but the, the thing that they've discovered, apparently, is that cockroaches can be compressed and and so they're looking at how is it that they can do that so they can get into your cupboards and your flower bin and, and things like that but they're using this then to develop a product that will be able to get into earthquakes and collapsed buildings and things like that so it's a it's an interesting project as well well let's look at some um, humanities and social science undergraduate research Kevin Ostovich, who's a professor of history at Valparaiso University, engages his first-year students in research about their own family history. And he wants the students to begin to think of themselves as historians and to understand the, the methodology of historical research. So he asked his students, as I said, to begin by investigating a possible mystery in their own family. And then one day, Kevin comes into class with a patch over his eye, and he tells the class that Professor Ostovich has been murdered, and that the class has to figure out who killed him. So there are clues he, uh, to the murder that are embedded in the library and the mu university archives. And so the, the students then engage in this collaborative process of discovering um, who was the murderer, and I think I remember correctly, and Rick, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but it was a retired provost who actually <laughs> was the murderer. Um, anyway, I, I had a chance to talk with one of Kevin's students, and she didn't pursue a, um, a history major, but she did say that the course helped her to develop skills in collaboration, meeting deadlines, communication, and use of evidence in her work in a youth intervention program. Now, Mary Isabel is here. Where are you, Mary? OK, so you can ask her about this and, um, later on. But Mary Isabel, who is a professor of English at the University of New Haven, and she teaches, um, I don't know if you can see that, but when she uh, teaches her undergraduate introduction course um, to the English major, she asks her students to collaborate, and please note, she's a humanist, um, asking her students to collaborate, um, to create a digital edition of a text from a public domain. And the students read the text on Project Gutenberg, and she and her students work together to decide what sort of context is needed to make sense of the text. So they divide up the responsibilities to create the notes, 
the students are and the students are learning about literary scholarship as well as learning other skills such as analysis, library skills, and collaboration. Um, Jonathan Davis is a professor of family studies at Samford University. And I think there's some folks from Samford here, but Jonathan isn't, so you can check with them. Um, he has identified what he calls a research practice gap, where practitioners tend to ignore research findings. And I should have mentioned he's in family studies at, at Samford. So he says that practitioners tend to ignore research findings, and scientists often find often study questions that are irrelevant to practice, or they fail to disseminate the findings in an accessible manner. So what they've done in the Samford Department of Family Studies is created a three-course sequence, beginning with the developing an annotated bibliography and a hypothesis, and ending with a senior thesis. And Davis and his colleagues believe that all students, whether they become practitioners or researchers, will benefit from doing real undergraduate, uh, real research as undergraduates. And also at, at Samford is Teresa Davidson, and she's a professor of sociology, and she has her students doing original research. And in her course, she asks her students to examine the world around them with scientific rigor. And they learn to develop testable research questions um, based on sociological theory, how to analyze social science research, and how to use the basic techniques of sociology um, uh, research of statistical analysis using SPSS. And her students have been the primary or secondary authors on topics such as attitudes towards access to post-secondary education for undocumented students, or um, access to public education for the children of undocumented migrants. And I think these are topics that Davis's, Jonathan Davis's students, um, that address his concern about the research practice um, gap. And Davidson's students are learning to do research on significant issues, and her students will be able to use their research skills in their practice after graduation. Well, what have these researchers tried to do is they integrate research into their courses, and particularly their first year courses. Primarily, I think they wanted to introduce students to the thinking and investigative processes of their disciplines. Kevin Ostovich wanted his students to learn to think like an historian. Jita Bangara wanted her students to learn scientific uh, research so they could successfully continue their education. Jonathan Davis wanted to increase the likelihood that practitioners would use research in their work and that researchers would investigate questions that would help practitioners. So I hope you can see from these examples that professors are finding some really creative ways to engage students in research that is appropriate to the discipline and appropriate for first and second year students. They're also, I think, able to mentor their students in the process by working collaboratively with the students in their courses. And in these early student experiences, the students are gaining the benefits of undergraduate research by learning to make observations, ask questions, explain and defend their ideas, to tolerate um, uncertainty, and to use evidence and to work collaboratively. Now, while each discipline has a different approach to research, I think there are some commonalities that can be included in first and second year courses in research. So students, I think they need to develop observation skills. And I think this is really particularly important because they need to learn to, f to focus and to pay close attention to their surroundings and the influences in their environment. And we, you see how distracted even we all can become with our cell phones and all of this. Students are even more so. So I think developing observation skills is a really critical um, piece for both research, but I also think, as Anne, Amy Herman said, for whatever profession that they're going to go into. They also need to develop library skills. And they, can do the, they need to be able to identify 
what are good resources for the projects that they want to engage in? And they need to know the difference between primary and secondary sources, and they also need to understand what do we mean when we talk about peer-reviewed resources. So this is something they can do in the first year, and many of you are probably already doing that in first-year classes. They also need to ask questions, and we need to encourage them to ask questions. And beyond that, they need to be able to understand what makes an actionable question and then think about how they can narrow that question down to a project that they could do in a semester. And that's, that's a hard thing for students to do, and they really do need some guidance in it. Um, they need to be able to apply the research methodology of the discipline on small and manageable projects. Um, and I think this one is really critical. They need to know how to use evidence, and they need to realize that they have to rely on evidence when they're making decisions and trying to understand what's happening. And the projects that they engage in should be projects that can either generate data or new interpretations or new ideas. And finally, I think when they can engage in collaborative projects, that's going to be another benefit to them for their future career. And then we should give them the opportunity to share their research um, through poster sessions, research days, or bringing together two sections of a class, but finding some way that they can share the results of their work. So a question I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation is the concern for time, cost, and student abilities when engaging in first and for engaging first and second year students in undergraduate research. And I'd like to suggest a couple of things. Um, many of you know about citizen science, and I think there's a lot of um, citizen science that could be available for projects in first year courses. Um, and recently, I've had a conversation. I've done a number of Earthwatch trips. Um, because I'm not a scientist, but I'm interested in it. And Earthwatch, if you don't know what it is, they, they fund um, science investigators and then volunteers um, go on these projects and, and provide a lot of the kind of grunt work, I guess, um, for the projects. But anyway, so I've had a conversation with Earthwatch recently, and they're engaging in a new project they call Urban Resilience. And what they want to do is study water quality and air quality in urban areas across the country. And they've started in Los Angeles and some of the East Coast cities. And they're working with a professor at the University of California, Riverside, on a National Science Foundation grant. And they've asked us if we would want to join with them in collecting some data, particularly on air quality. And they're suggesting that there are sensors that can be used that are pretty inexpensive, and a whole class could um, gather data on the air quality in different parts of their campus and different parts of their community, and then contribute it to this national database. They've also suggested that maybe we might want to write a joint or collaborative National Science Foundation um, grant to involve our students in first and second year research using some of these ideas on urban resilience. So maybe um, We'd like to talk about that later. Some of you may remember from the University of Redlands uh, Summer Institute when David Asai, who is a program officer director at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, talked about his CFACES project. And if you want, which is a good example, I think, of something that can be done with first or second year students. And if you want to know more about that, you can look at um, his video on our website or go to CureNet, which is a, um, an organization or a, a database that was started at the University, University of Texas, Austin, and collecting examples of course-based first-year research, mostly in biology. And so this project is, is there, and it, it will tell you all about how to do it. But I, I think it's something that would provide real research experiences for students, but in a cost-effective way, and something that could easily be integrated into a first-year biology um, course. And the National Archives has started a project um, called Operation War Diary, where they're digitizing World War I letters. And this is a possible uh, project that students could contribute to. But I think more importantly than that, just thinking about issues of war letters and 
all, in almost all of our communities, there are young men and women who have gone off to war, young men in World War II and the Vietnam War, and young women now. And many of those um, soldiers sent letters home, and their families and, and loved ones sent, and friends sent them letters. Um, and th so I think if those letters have been saved, it could be a very interesting project to look at views of the war, views of what was happening over there, understanding the political aspects of it and what impact it had on soldiers, which could be political science research, it could be psychological research, it could be sociological research or historical research. And it even could lead to some of the things that Jennifer talked about yesterday of writing short stories or perhaps short plays. And I recently met a women, woman who was doing, had a contest for 10 minute plays on, she was particularly concerned with um, animals who were becoming extinct. So the contest was writing a short play about animals who were becoming extinct. And um, so there's a number of, I think, interesting projects that could be included <clears throat> in a first year course. Well, I'd like to end with one more story. And several years ago, I attended a legislative seminar in Wisconsin, and I met a first-year student who was doing really cutting-edge research in developing tiny cellular tools. And, um, he, and he was doing this in the first semester of his um, college experience at, I think it was the University of Wisconsin, Whitewater. Um, and he, he made a discovery that led to a patent and a spin-off business. And I had, a, Daniel, I had a conversation with him um, last fall, and he is now pursuing a PhD in linguistics. And he, he told me, or he said, I did not go into science um, for grad school, but instead found that my analytic side found a home in applied linguistics. Research developed many analytical skills, as well as a mindset about how to go about and develop new programs and proje projects confidently. And this has continuously in, uh, resulted in acknowledgments in my jobs. I have the confidence to identify tools I need to accomplish something and learn them on the spot, such as computer programming and publishing software. Research definitely helps foster a resourcefulness and refines it to a point where it can be applicable to many scenarios outside any specific field. At least that this has been my experience. And I think Daniel's statement provides support for the idea that undergraduate research is beneficial to students regardless of the career they pursue. Course-based research that is authentic and accessible can provide every student with the intellectual benefits of undergraduate research. And I think our communities will benefit when they apply their research skills and our and knowledge to the important questions in their professional and community lives. And whatever path your students choose, they will develop skills and attributes that prepare them for success in any field because of your work to engage students in undergraduate research. And some might even experience the thrill of discovery. So I'd like to thank the faculty and students who shared their undergraduate research stories with me. Um, and thank you. And before. Thank you. <laughs> Before I end, I had um, Michelle Famil Familaro um, put some cards on your table. And what I would like to ask you to do is two things. One is if you're doing anything in core space research, if you would tell me your name and your email address. Um, because I've been talking with a publisher about doing a, a monograph or a book on for core space research in the first two years. And so I'd like to know what you're doing so we might be able to develop something along those lines. And then the second thing is, and maybe you've picked up the flyer about digital scholarship, but we are doing this workshop on digital scholarship um, at St. Edward's next October. And so if you need more information about that, if you're interested in attending, we'd like to keep in close touch with you as the planning of that um, continues. 
So in indicate either one that you're doing first um, course-based research or um, you want to attend a digital scholarship. And I, ha I think, is there time for some questions? I don't know what time it is. We have three minutes? Okay. Well, are there any questions in the three minutes? Okay. Well, thank you very much.